Hello and welcome to another episode of Saline Magic Carpet. This is part number two in the mini-series that we're doing about the restoration of Magic Carpet, our Vinda 32. Now, just in case you're new here, Magic Carpet four years ago fell 20 feet off a crane and smashed onto concrete below. She was a total write-off. Um, and at that point, Aladino found her and actually decided to purchase her and do a huge restoration, repairing all of the things which had broken. So in the last episode, we talked about why Aladino made the decision to take on such a huge project. Um, and in this episode, we're going to talk about what was actually damaged. Now, of course, um, the damage on the hull is the most obvious part, but there were lots of other damages throughout the entire boat. So we're just going to go through everything that happened. And in the next episodes, we'll be talking more in depth about each specific damage and how Aladino actually approached fixing it. A really quick disclaimer is that during this whole restoration process, for the first three years of it, I wasn't here. And so we don't have a lot of footage from that time. Aladino did take photos. That's why we're doing it in this more kind of like interview format and I'll put photos on the screen over top. I'm sorry we don't have more actual footage to show you from the restoration itself. Yeah, I was not into filming back then. Um, but uh, what I did is I took tons of photos and actually that was because I started taking notes first and the notes were basically to remember things. How were things wired up? Where was this mounted? What was this? But I realized that they, that took a lot of time so then I just uh, skipped to taking photos. So I have a library of over a thousand photos now so we can add a lot of photos in between our talk here. Yeah. And those photos actually really came in handy at the end, like during the last year of the restoration when I met Aladino and I was also helping mm -hmm. with the last stages. Um, we were kind of putting the boat back together, redesigning the interior, putting in electrical and plumbing and stuff like that. And then the photos actually really came in handy to see how it was done before because Aladino took everything out of the boat. Anyway, we're rambling, so let's get back to the main point of this video, which is talking about the damages that occurred. So Aladino has the insurance survey that was done just after the boat fell. And in that survey, a lot of the damages are listed and explained. Um, but of course, there were some extra damages that the insurance survey didn't even find at the time. So yeah, that was funny. The surveyor um, came back like one year later and we talked about it a little bit. He was actually interested as a surveyor what he had missed mm -hmm. since um, I mean, he had to do it in three days and he did an amazing job. But still, obviously, there are things you miss. And I discovered a new damage behind everything I dismantled behind every cabinet or thing I took apart. So that was also interesting for him. Yeah. So I have a 30 page survey here and it's all in German. <laughs> so uh, the other day I just um, highlighted the few big damages and uh, took some notes in English for you guys. I made two big, two big categories. One was fiberglass works that had to be done and the others were wooden repairs that had to be done. Since Magic Carpet is, let's call it 50-50, they made the hole out of fiberglass, but everything else is wooden. So it's only the shell, so to speak. And up from there, um, they built all the interior, the bulkheads, uh, the 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 bunks and the cabin top all out of mahogany and then they laid a teak deck on top of it so it is pretty much 50 50 and also i divided my repairs like that because i decided i want to do fiberglass first and then i switched to the wooden parts there was one a uh, big vertical crack midships uh, and it was about one meter but when you do a repair on fiberglass, you, it actually extends to a way bigger area. So being through the hole, the thickness of the damage is important. And you have to make it a lot bigger to get the strength flowing again from bow to stern, like to make the whole hole strong again. You don't just Paste pa it yeah, patch up where it's broken, actually. But like fiberglass it's everything is connected it's strings of glass and it's layers 
it's all woven and it is um, multi-directional multi-directional also but it's just there is an energy flow in it so to reconstruct that you have to make way bigger repairs than just the area which is affected mm -hmm. so that one meter crack vertical crack mid chips on the side of a hole ended up being a two and a half square meter um, repair, repair area. area yeah mm -hmm. So that was one big job, and I think that's the one I started with. That was the first thing I did. Then, obviously, the stern had blown off. And with that, many other small damages come by. So in the list, for example, I listed that because of the stern coming off, the deck disconnected from the hole. And that is also a very crucial thing. So for like three meters from the stern, the deck had come off the hole. Uh, another thing, the teak toe rail was very damaged. The rubbing rail was torn apart. The whole stern was cracked and strongly damaged. I could hold the fiberglass and wiggle it and it was all loose. And you could see in between the layers, you could see how many layers they had applied just because of the impact, the resin cracked. And normally you cannot distinguish it. Like at the end, it's just one solid layer of fiberglass. But from the impact, it became so brittle that you could actually see all like the it layers. All separated. Yeah, it separated. Yeah, I'm sure you, we can see that on the photos. So we were worried about distortion of the hole also. How am I getting everything back together without having a twist or something funny going on in the hole? So the stern pulpit was bent, obviously. It was ripped out of its mountings. The swim ladder was crushed. Also the engine room bulkhead was broken. That is the first bulkhead after the stern going in. Repairing that was quite tricky actually because of um, difficult accessibility. I was actually quite happy that the stern had blown off so I could crawl in from the hole and it was way easier. Also to reconnect the deck to the hole and everything was way better to repair without the stern. <laughs> also the back section of the keel got crushed from the impact and with it the rudder mounting and the rudder obviously since the rudder is attached at the end of the keel. Thinking back now, that was very tricky in terms of alignment, since at the very end of the full keel, you mount the rudder shaft, and the shaft goes all the way up through the deck to where the tiller is mounted, and it is very hard to get everything aligned perfectly to make it fit to the millimeter at the end that was another big thing so actually i think we will go into the big missions in detail in um the Thank next the yeah in the next episodes now it's a bit about the big overview propeller was bent propeller shaft had to be checked if it was bent or not those were all small details coming along with it Interestingly, also the bow was very affected. You really have to see the hull as one when it's done and comes out of the mold. So even having an impact aft at the stern, there might be something broken at the very opposite side of it. So the bow was also affected. Also the trailer was attached to the boat when the accident happened. So the trailer got damaged and caused a lot of damage too, since it was flying down with the boat and it got tangled with the bow pulpit. So we got some nice damage also in the front of the boat. The bow pulpit got smashed with it, the position lights, the anchor roller was pretty much two dimensional. The windless motor was broken. I took it apart. 
But that was because of another reason, though, wasn't it? That was because of another reason, yes. <laughs> but anyway, it was broken. <laughs> <laughs> the teak tow rail was damaged everywhere. The lifelines had ripped, so I had to replace all the wires, which were small details. But I'm trying to list everything here. There were dents and scratches on the bow. Stainless steel rail was bent. Um, and then to the cabin top. The cabin top is solid mahogany. So there was a two meter crack on the massive mahogany cabin top. From an impact like that, energy has to go somewhere. And it so happened to, well, crack the cabin top, which was, I think, this, one of the saddest part of the damage to me since fiberglass you can repair perfectly in my opinion in this case make it look even prettier than it was before with some extra effort but the wood you almost always see a repair in wood unless you rebuild it take it apart completely make it new if you repair it it's visible so that's what happened with Magic Carpet. The crack is still visible. Now it's part of the history of the boat. Yeah, yeah. part of the history. Yeah, one funny f fact, maybe. I was even thinking of uh, varnishing the hole instead of paint. So all the, after repairing, obviously, just to have all the damages visible. <laughs> 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 but then I thought, I might want to sell the boat again, I do it white. Also, I had other colors in mind, but everybody disagreed and they were like, it's a classic boat, it has to be white. And what if you sell it? Oh, and another detail here. I was also thinking since the stern blew out, why not make it longer? I would want more storage room. I could change the whole design of the boat. So I was actually, I have some sketches where I was thinking, about extending the stern um, and I talked to a yacht designer. I sent her a long email with my thoughts and then I got a very good informative email back. And basically she was saying uh, that it is possible but since Windus they have the mast already way forward on the cabin top it would make sense to think about making it a catch or a yawl in this case and uh, stepping a second mast if I would elongate the boat. So again I thought I don't know how long this project is taking me let's keep it simple I try to rebuild it as it was so that idea was rejected. Another part of the tragedy is that the mast was on the boat when the accident happened so it was not stepped as it should be. It was taken down, put on two, what do you call those wooden things? Like the sawhorses. Yeah, put on like two sawhorses and then lying horizontally on the boat, which we do occasionally just uh, because of storage reasons. Um, the boats with the shorter masts, they stay on, on the boat. But in this case, after the accident, it just, made the mess bigger. The trailer was dangling on the straps of the crane. The mast was half attached to the boat. It was a huge mess. I was not here when that happened, but I came a few months after to start my apprenticeship. And yeah, so I did not see how it occurred, but I just reconstructed it and saw it on pictures. So also the mast got damaged. So the mast got dented in a few places and I was pretty concerned actually. But again there I asked a few sailors I know. Uh, my boss for example, he's a world champion in many different sailboat classes and he said how the masts were built back then, this is not going to affect it. I was worried, um, less experience of course and it did seem like a severe damage to me. But then I talked to some riggers and um, I made a repair. We tested the boat in quite some windy... Yeah, we did. <laughs> in quite some windy weather this summer, yeah. so it's all holding together and it's perfect, mm -hmm. actually. 
Well, the repair you did is is a really good repair yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah totally. Actually, that is one thing that I do have footage of because that's one of the last things that we did, and I think I took a little bit of film of that. So we can maybe do a quick video on the mast repair later on as well. Yeah. So just to mention here that nothing, nothing stayed untouched. Nothing escaped. <laughs> nothing escaped. With the mast getting dented and uh, bent a little, also the aluminum forestay got bent. That was easy, just bend it back. That works in aluminum, luckily. And then there were just various cracks in the interior. Like I'm not even getting into this in detail. There was just one big mess in the interior. Um, the bulkheads were loose. This is a severe one. Um, also, they are just uh, held in by screws. Many boats do it differently, but I like when they are actually fiberglassed in they're onto tabbed. the hull when they're tabbed. Yeah. That's what I did with the main bulkhead. Uh, the bunks were detached from the hull and there were just minor, minor details everywhere through the boat. The only part that I was hoping and thought didn't get any damage was the engine. So just when I started this project, I had come from high school, I had my student hands and I was creative in many ways. I always uh, created and did a lot of things, but I never thought of doing something like this. So also engines, I didn't have a clue. I didn't know how an engine works. Now I'm learning more and more still, and I'm also getting more interested, with he which helps in learning. Yeah, I'm a bit a person. I only do what I'm motivated to do. So the engine I didn't touch for three years. Um, I was hoping it would be okay. And amazingly, pretty much when we met and the boat was almost finished, we started it and it started right up the first time. Yeah, that was incredible. That was incredible. Mm -hmm. And it was surreal. With all the engines we have here, we have about a hundred boats, which we winterize every year. I motor around. There is not one engine that is that calm. It's a very well equilibrated three cylinder engine and it just barely made any sound compared to other engines. Yeah. But I also stuck my head further down into the bilge and after starting the engine and after yeah repairing the whole boat I found out that the engine mountings were also cracked. So I was like wow there was really nothing that didn't get affected. But it was quite an easy and fix. It was an easy fix, but that's a really dangerous one if you didn't notice it. Yeah, because we, we had actually it, yeah, we imagine. only noticed that right at the end. And actually we noticed it after we started the engine for mm. the first time. But yeah, I was very happy that I discovered that the mounting was cracked, so I just had to detach the engine from the blocks, lift it. You just put a rope on this on the beam on the ceiling here, I think. Yeah, I just put a yeah. rope on the beam and then lifted the engine, took them off, uh, brought them to the welder. So I had that welded, mounted it, and it worked just fine. Yeah, imagine the engine wiggling loose, yeah. loosely inside there. Yeah. So that is a very um, rough description, again, a list of the damages that occurred. And pretty much the next step, what I did, I made a list of the big damages with the survey. It also had an estimate on how long it takes to repair it by a professional, which I was not by then, and what the materials cost more or less. So I just took all that information together. For example, the initial task would be to empty the boat out completely, bring it into the boatyard, take it off the trailer, all of that, Prop let's say, so. yeah, set up to start repairing, uh, make all the damages accessible and all of that. So for example, there they had listed it would take 50 hours. Then uh, repairing the rudder, obviously taking it off the boat, repairing, and then including also putting it back together, that would be 30 hours. The repair on port side, midships, another 50 hours. So just step by step listing all those things, I 
came to the rough conclusion that just the fiberglass repairs would be 400 hours. And then I made a different one just about the wooden things. And that came to 200 hours. And also I calculated um, the cost of the materials and on fiberglass that would have been around 3,000 bucks and on the wooden side about 2,000 bucks. So that's what I started with. I started with thinking, okay, this will take me at least 600 hours and about 5,000 bucks. So there is many steps in this survey that I want to show you. It's in German, but you still can see the figures. So I had to cross out a few things in the survey though. This, be, this being a proper survey to get it back to pristine conditions. For example, they list 400 bucks would be transportation to a professional paint shop and then a professional paint job for a boat this size in Switzerland is easily ten thousand dollars so those are things I crossed out from the survey so I crossed out that um, also switching the masts replacing the rigging by a brand new one would have been 15 grants. I crossed that out the list. Repairing the trailer, I figured I would not need it anymore. That, would, that was another 900 bucks. Um, a swimming ladder, I thought, I wanna, ah, I didn't really care back then. I just crossed it out. <laughs> now, now we, now we, now, want we <laughs> <laughs> now we want one, but back then it was just peanuts. The whole stern pulpit, I figured I, could, I, I will figure something out. I'm not buying a new one for 2,300 bucks. And also the bow pulpit, I would not pay 2,000 bucks. So there's just little steps coming in the future, adding up to the story. I ended up buying a new pulpit since um, I could not repair it. Um, but I think it was like uh, 600 bucks. So that is qu quite a difference. <laughs> Also, my philosophy changed a lot. When I started repairing the boat, I thought I'd just fix some fiberglass, fix some wood, and I go sailing. And um, I had a really humble approach, and I just thought, I mean, whatever, I have my hammock in there, or, yeah, I didn't really know. But now, becoming more and more involved, and, yeah, I really started paying attention to detail. Mm -hmm. For example, I thought the electrical system. I didn't know much about electrical when I started. So also I was scared and I had a lot of respect behind all those uh, wires and all that spaghetti mess. So I took a lot of photos and I thought I would put it back together exactly that way. After three years of rebuilding everything inside, I was like, screw it, I'm rebuilding a brand new electrical system too yeah. <laughs> and that's what we have done together mm -hmm. this last winter just be before the boat was ready and launched and actually we got a bit of help with that from my dad um, we spent last winter in canada with my parents and my dad is a first class marine engineer in canada and he is i mean beyond just his actual qualifications from school he has so much experience. I mean, he sailed around the world on old wooden tall ships. Um, he's worked on tugboats going from Seattle to Alaska. So he just has like a wealth of experience and it's his passion as well. So he totally. helped us a lot designing kind of um, the, you know, figuring out all the math for the electrical system, making sure it was going to work properly. We might make uh, an electrical chapter yeah, as well. Yeah, I think we will, because that's, that's a complicated and big topic. Yeah, that was a big topic. Yeah. Um, I really liked the electrical project as well because that kind of project is a little bit more how my brain works. I'm less good at the whole like big sanding and fixing cracks and that kind of stuff, but I really like the sitting down with pen and paper and like doing all the math, drawing the circuits, figuring it out, wiring things together, and then you turn on the light bulb and it works. Mm -hmm. So that was a cool project for me. I got really involved in that one. Yeah, I totally. liked that. Yeah. yeah. You did awesome. Thanks. You did awesome on everything else. Thanks. <laughs> and also the electrical. <laughs> well, I aged quite a bit doing it. 
Yeah, just to wrap it up, um, I'm repeating quite often, but I had the survey. I crossed uh, very expensive things out of it. Um, I thought expensive, but also unnecessary if you're doing it by yourself. Expensive and unnecessary, yeah. and I mean also risking. Like obviously, when there is a damage, and that guy uh, has an insurance, you have to replace it to back to exactly how it was or better. Mm -hmm. The mast is dented and bent you will have to replace it by a new well, one. It's and not bent. It's, it's it, not it bent, it. but it's not how it was. As an insurance company, you can't just say, oh, this is fine, you know, and repair it yourself. They would have to purchase a new one. Exactly, and that's yeah. easy, 10 to 15 grand. Yeah. So just by crossing out all those things and finger crossed and I do it myself, um, that's how I started. It ended up being a lot more, many more hours, a lot longer. Also, because but you also did more things than you initially thought yeah, you would. Totally. Yeah, totally. I mean, once I had everything out of the boat to have the damages accessible and, for example, do the, the fiberglass repair midships, I thought, why not sand it all and give it all some fresh paint? So, actually, I took everything out of the boat, even where it was good. Mm -hmm. I had this vision of sailing around the world and this is my home forever. So I reinforced the chain plates, I reinforced where the stanchions are mounted, all those things that I was learning that are... Important. Important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for watching. I hope that you got something out of this video. Um, now this mini-series is going to keep continuing. We're going to go more in-depth into how some of these repairs w were made and how we designed some of the different components on the boat. Um, yeah, we don't want to bore you too much repeating details, but we have all those amazing subscribers and we just want to give them a little step-by-step -step introduction in what I have done here and yeah. what we have done. Totally. So, yeah. Thanks for all of you guys that are interested and um, the ones that are not. We have sailing videos coming bi-weekly also. Yeah, totally. And as I always do, I want to take a moment to thank uh, all of our Patreons. You guys have changed our lives, seriously. Like, we're still just amazed and in awe most of the time um, that we actually have people supporting us on this whole thing. Yeah, I don't believe it. Um, I especially want to thank a few of our Patreons who have been with us for a while and who really give us a lot to keep doing what we're doing. And that is Pat Mornin, Scott Grometer, Lloyd Feldbaum, James F. Gardner, J John Dodd, and Jeffrey Robbins. I've got it memorized nice. now. <laughs> thank you so much, you guys. Uh, your support yeah, means thanks. a whole lot.